All right, everybody, welcome back. So it's going to be that time of year again. We're looking for a 10-week course in options introduction. It's basically an A to Z of options focused on the beginner. So we run this usually about once a year. Um, anybody who's already taken the class is, of course, invited back. You don't have to pay. Once you're in, you're in. You get to take it as many times as we run the course. And for anybody new looking to get into it, we are going to cover everything from when options really got started in the markets, how they've evolved since they've been here, and how you can approach it either from doing income trades or just boosting your existing portfolio of stock that you can use these in a multitude of uh, trading styles from short duration, longer term, nearly investment when we get into things like the wheel to um, complex trades, earnings trades, and even neutral plays, which a lot of times that is a, a lean to for me. You know, when I look around and, and there's really nothing that I want to trade long or short, I can nearly always find something going sideways. So it's just a nice tool to have in the toolbox. And as much as everybody says that options are a complex thing, I've made it my specialty, nearly an art to make these non-complicated, right? Because they don't have to be complicated. Being able to ask questions, to get feedback, and to build on that foundation of communication. So these courses, um, 10 weeks, we still haven't decided how many hours we're going to have per week. And once we get a number of people in here, we'll run a poll to see what time of day we're going to do them. I believe last time we ran them on the weekend because the majority of the people who were going to be taking the class were going to be at work during the week and they just preferred to have it on the weekend. Don't quote me on that, but I believe that's what it was to me. It doesn't really matter whatever the group decides, that's when we're going to do it. So if you're interested in taking this, this A to Z introduction to options course, you'll want to reach out to me in a DM. Um, you can hit me up through the YouTube, just connecting to me through the about page. My email address is there and different ways to communicate with me. I look forward to hearing from you and I will see you there. It's hump day. So we're still dealing with jobs data. Uh, you could see yesterday the power of this data when we got the jolts numbers. If you forget the acronym for that, it's basically take this job and shove it. That's those numbers. When you find yourself in a position where you're, you've got a job that you don't like and you think you can go somewhere else and get a better job, that's the number that they're recording. And what the market took from the jolts numbers yesterday is that uh, things are getting more difficult out there to find a new job, which implies the Fed is doing, they're finally accomplishing their goal a little bit at a time of slowing down this runaway market and this runaway economy, which also implies that maybe they don't need to hike and that they might pause, officially pause, which they have not yet announced an official pause. All right, so bad news is good news. That sent the market ripping to the upside along with the Bitcoin news. So that was another stimulus. And then the China stimulus added on top of that, it was like a four pack punch by the time we evaluate all the different things that sent the market to the upside yesterday, including the move out of US dollar Japan and the move that we saw in the 10 year yields in the dollar. So just a absolutely fantastic day yesterday when we have all those data points to lean on and that we know we can just continue to take another long trade and another trade and another trade without the, uh, the typical fear of, well, it's gone too far. Maybe I shouldn't try to take this trade. And, you know, it's just absolutely amazing. So hopefully you took advantage of yesterday. Those kind of days don't come around very often. You want to get them while the getting is good. Today, it's going to be more data on jobs. This whole week is like jobs week. And we have to remember to pair that with the other side of the coin, that as the week progresses, we're going to see less and less volume. If you're newer to trading, you might not quite grasp that danger, but here's the rub. Here's the, the danger to the whole thing. When we are in a low volume environment, we can see the markets make extreme moves. And the reason behind that is because when there's not very many participants, it doesn't take much to make a market move. Right. So 
on a typical day, if a big trader came in with, I don't know, a thousand contracts of the ES, they could maybe move the ES two or three points. Okay. I mean, that's, that's not very much, two or three points. When volume trading is really light and there's not a lot of participants and the dome is really thin, a thousand contract move could move the ES 20 points. That's a, that's a big difference, right? So in this low volume environment, as the week progresses, it's going to get lighter. We're going to continue to get these really big data points that go directly to the heart of the mission of the Fed right now, which is to uh, slow down this runaway economy. They keep saying that they don't necessarily want to eliminate jobs, but they want to cool off the labor market. And they want to see unemployment numbers going up. So they want more bad data, right? They want more bad news. And they're going to be getting a lot of the data this week, each week as time goes by. So just kind of keep all that in mind. You can see also tonight we have a lot of data coming out of Japan. We're looking to get some clarity on uh, the moves that we saw yesterday and a little bit of today. Looking at Market Watch, which is a, a great source for just the highest impact uh, expected events for the day. This isn't where you would want to go if you're looking for a list of everything that could come out. This is just more useful for the higher impact ones. Nine o'clock, 10 o'clock. Uh, that was yesterday. You go back and see you know, the, the outcome at 10 o'clock because the job openings is what sent us uh, on a tear today it's 8 15 8 30 and then 10 o'clock don't sleep on that pending home sales you'd be surprised how often that one can uh, change things so look at what's going on around the world we're kind of flat really i mean it, i know it shows that we're in a mixed market with some red some green but look at the change percent nothing more than a half of a percent in either direction we're not crazy up we're not crazy down we're just kind of holding the line and trying to absorb this move that we had yesterday, which is not a bad thing, right? It's good to see a market pause like this. Uh, if it just continued in one direction wildly out of control, then it would become unsustainable and like a house of cards, it would all just fall apart. So this pause here is good. It's healthy. Notice that we're kind of sitting in the middle really close to the uh, to the flat line but we're in the red japan is doing better china's basically flat the s p and the nasdaq and the dow are just slightly in the red and if we go down more we can see the small caps down nearly a half of a percent and it's important to recognize which indexes are up which ones are down and what that kind of implies. So the dash for trash, penny stock, short covering rallies, all those kind of names. Um, that's what I think of when I think of the Russell. We're down in those the most. But still, after the move that we saw yesterday, it's not like we're down on the week, right? We're just down a little bit trying to digest that move. So here we've got U.S. dollars, or excuse me, we got Japan 10-year yields. Now, they were running this yield control program for a while. And you can see I've got 25% marked out. Things were just holding there really well. And then it started to get out of control. So they readjusted and they said, okay, well, we'll, we'll do yield control at, at a half of a percent. Then that got out of control and they said, okay, well, we'll do yield control to um, 1%. Okay, so now this is this year. We're into February, March. This is all of 2023 here. So you can see how we're getting into that unsustainable range. And as soon as they made the announcement they were, that they were willing to let it go to 1%, this thing made a jump up to like 0.65, and they immediately came in and whacked it back down kind of sending some mixed messages there like, yeah, well, we'll, we'll let it go to 1%, but don't move too fast or we're just going to whack you back down again. So it, it has been working its way up 
They're still holding below that 0.7. But you can see how it's on tenable, right? This thing has become unmoored. It's unhooked. Use whatever language you want. It continues to move to the upside. Take a look at US dollar Japan here. Yesterday, we got above 4.7 and actually continued to the upside for just a little bit more. And then it just dumped. So take it to the intraday. So you know what kind of signal we saw yesterday that got our attention? It was that move right there. So talk about falling out of bed. I'm on a five-minute chart here, and it is unmistakable, right? So, you know, people say, well, what am I supposed to watch? What am I looking for? You're looking for something like this, which is why most of the time we're easily able to glance at a chart and say, no, don't worry about it. It's fine. There's nothing there. Because most of the time when you look at a chart, you don't see that, right? That big giant stick bar to the downside. So that's what you're looking for. You're looking for something to get your attention. Most of the time, you know, US dollar, Japan, the 10 year, the DXY, and you're just looking at these charts trying to figure out what exactly am I supposed to be looking for? That. That's pretty simple, right? I mean, if it's not doing something crazy extreme like that, you're probably pretty good. Nothing to worry about, you know? See how much easier life gets, huh? So with that move to the downside, we had a nice push in the precious metals, silver, gold, uh, gold miners, nice solid push to the upside along with everything else, right? Except oil really didn't get much out of it. You know, I mean, a, a little bit, nice outside bar, but we still got a lot of problems with oil. So watch that 82. If we can get above this pivot here, then um, we can get back up to at least year-to-date highs, right? So let's watch that uh, 82.13, get past that, and we'll focus on, what is that, 85, basically, in a, as an overshoot. Let's kind of tone that down a little bit. At that way. Eighty-four, eighty-five. Classic double bottom in gold. It's been working its way up off of those lows. Beautiful TRP setup. It's not done, but you have to kind of imagine where the halfback level is. All right, so be a little mindful of the halfback. We hit it yesterday. We're kind of digesting around it this morning. If it's going to fail, it's going to fail here. And remember, it can overshoot as long as it stays below 1946, then it still has the, um, the capacity to fall down. Because even though, it, you know, in a textbook perfect world, the halfback level would be the line in the sand. This, in the real world, it just doesn't work that way. We got to give it a little latitude. And right now that latitude is this area back here where there's potentially unfinished business, 1946. So as long as we're still below that, we have the capacity to come back down still. If we get above it, then we're going to focus on heading back up to 1987. So as you can see, it's a full house, 8, 815, 830, 10 o'clock. 10.30, and then tonight we got a lot of that uh, Japan data. So as you can see, we're kind of going through the um, morning prep, and there's nothing in here that we haven't already covered. You kind of scroll back a little bit. 
going to a place like Finance Juice is a news aggregate source, right? This saves you from having to jump to 10, 20, 30 different websites trying to check the, the headliners. It'll just grab all the headliners and bring it to you. You can use the filter to eliminate news sources that you don't want. Things like, oh, I don't know, Fox News and CNN, for an example. Throw that junk out the window so that what's left is news that you actually want to, uh, to hear about. So we are looking at a 50% chance of a 25 basis point rate hike coming out of Europe. This is uh, the ECB. European bonds and stocks fell after the latest round of price data suggests that inflation in the Eurozone may be still on the rise. And they're looking to hike. Right, so kind of keep that in mind. All right, so far, we've kept most of that push. Now, when you get a big bar like we had yesterday, one of the things that you want to do is mark that half back, right? So we go to a daily chart, and just kind of clean all this stuff up, and measure yesterday's range. The half back level is 44.71. Now, we can get a little more complex with this, and we can add a FIB level in there, the 78.6% level. In this pullback, if we're looking for a pullback that's going to continue to the upside, it really needs to hold above that 78.6. And that's a completely different discussion than the halfback. Right? The, as long as it holds the halfback, there's the argument that the move could continue, Right, that, that we could carry that bullish bias. If we hold above the 786, we could continue the current trajectory, the current momentum. Especially if we start getting into OCR analysis instead of the old school classic analysis. So for a, a more strict line in the sand, 4493 needs to hold. And by hold, we can wick down below it. We just need to get back above it. Right underneath that, by the way, is the orange line sitting here. That's the 50 day moving average. Below that is the 20 and the 10. So if we were looking for a picture of health, uh, the fact that we're now back above the 50 is a good start, but we still need the 10 and the 20 to get back above the 50 as well to complete that, that package deal. Mm-hmm. We're already out there. We might as well take a look at the week. We are looking at an inside week breakout. We managed to get through that level yesterday. Let's just kind of highlight that level. Yesterday was so good, right? Just you got to get them while you can. And it was pretty fantastic. You really got to ask yourself if you missed it yesterday. Why did you miss it? What was going on that you weren't aware of, of the uh, nonstop, just runaway powerhouse of that move. And how can you fix that so that you don't miss it again, right? So we are inside week breakout. 4485 uh, is going to help us maintain that. And we are started into the TRB. Now, when it comes to a TRB, there's no perfect to this. I would have liked a little bit more of a base first before we started the breakout, but we are now on the breakout phase. So the next level that we need to kind of be concerned with lines up at, I love it when things just line up, at the 111 line. Isn't that beautiful? It just kind of validates the data that we have. Right? So 45, 17, and three ticks is the next level of concern. And we're pretty close to that. We got there pretty close yesterday, 45.16, and it's 45.17.75. Not bad. Okay, so we got to get through that, and then we'll focus on the next one. And it's just going to continue to be that way, level by level by level all the way up. And that has been, and it continues to still be my, my argument, right? We're going to get the TRB, and we're going to work our way back up to that 
4650 area. Volume is well within range. We were talking about light volume, but you certainly can't see it there. All right, 10-day, 30-minute volume profile. Hey, we've got a new high. If we had managed to make it through yesterday without breaking this pivot from last Wednesday into Thursday, that would have been the new high on the profile. Instead, we have a new high. So when we're at the lows, we go to the highs. When we're at the highs, we go to the lows. This low that you see down here from Friday of a few weeks ago, it wasn't the low at the time, right? It just happens to be the low now. Kind of keep that in mind. I'm going to continue to circle back and point that out until using this chart becomes more comfortable for you. It just takes some time to get used to. So we can see the fib level a little bit better now, maybe. If I kind of clean it up, maybe make it a, a brighter color. 44.93 needs to hold for the 7.86. What that will do is continue that move, right? So if you got a regular price action, it pulls back a little bit and you have a continuation. Well, that pullback should not exceed certain levels, right? It's only allowed to pull back so far. After it breaches that level, so we consider that the current trend is no longer in a trend because the current trend pulled back too far. The next concern is now that we've pulled back, we've got to come back up and we've got to get a new high. We have to get a new high. But that's for later today. It's not for right now. So we don't really need to worry about it. The only thing we got to worry about right now is 44.93. Looking at the classic shape here, we do still have it. But the longer we spend up at these highs, the, uh, the more we're going to build this profile out. So we're, what we had was a classic D. But now we're getting a little bit of that pigtail. So uh, by tomorrow, we're very likely we'll have a lowercase b. And the longer we spend in this zone, we might eventually start to end up with a capital B. We're still looking at the point of control, 4421, to get moved up. It's got a ways to go first before that happens. You can see how shallow it is back here. And that's because we spent just so many days at this level, right? We spent a long time down there. So it's going to be a while before that point of control moves up. There's really nothing on the TPO to... Um, you know, give us any insight, but there is a shallow area. It's interesting to note, you know, normally when we think of pivot points, like last week's high, for an example, we think about high volume areas, and that's not what we have. In fact, if we break through our own Globex low this morning, it's shallow, and it's likely that we fall all the way down to the halfback before we even consider that we've uh, found some support anywhere, right? Because there's just nothing here to help us out. All right, mapping out the five by five. We don't have a point of control to focus on from yesterday because we've ripped through it multiple times since we opened it last night. And the next VPOC is all the way up at 4,600. So we don't really have anything. We can see that shallow area here again. So if we break through 4,490, it gets really shallow. We're going to get no help until we get around 4,470. That's a nice 20 point drop. That's the play of the day for me at this point. If we fail 44.90, the target is 44.70. And it's very likely to happen fast. We're very likely to go through that zone quickly. We break below 44.70. We should be able to get all the way back to the RTH open. So a full reversal on the day. That's not my base case argument, by the way. I don't think we're going to make that kind of move. I really don't think we're going to give it back. But. Uh, it's on the table, right? All right, as you would imagine, we are completely outside of the weekly expected move. Just to kind of help you if you're not used to seeing this chart. 
that was the range for the week. We should close inside that range about 80% of the time at the end of the week. So Friday, we go into the close, we should be inside that box about 80% of the time. The easiest way to count for percentages is just to count with a round number of 10 or 100. So if we count back over the last 10 weeks, how many of those weeks did we close outside the box? If it's more than two, then we're breaking our, our average. Generally speaking, things start to unravel with little signals and little warnings before things actually just unravel and go straight to hell. One of those things, one of those warnings happens to be closing outside the range. So one close one time, it's not a really big deal. Repeated examples of closing outside of the range, uh, especially back-to-back -back repeated episodes of closing outside the range is one of those warnings that we really want to pay attention to. Two weeks ago, we ended the week outside the box. Okay, I mean, that's not too bad. Two weeks ago from that, we ended the range outside of the box, right? Three weeks ago from that, we ended outside of the box. How many weeks is that? Not counting the current week because the current week isn't closed. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. That's three out of 10. And out of that, there's still one more. That's four out of 10 weeks where we closed at the end of the week outside the box. Now, there's nothing in here that's telling me we go long, we go short. That, that's not the point. The point is there's something wrong that the market makers are mispricing volatility. It's not getting pumped into the market. It's not getting priced into the market. And that we are exceeding our expected move more than we should by a long measure. One of the things that this tells you to do is not run iron condors right now. Okay, so it, it's as simple as that. We can take a lot of things away from this, but we want actionable things. One of the actionable things that we want right now is we don't want to do any iron condors. An iron condor is a trade that says, I bet you don't move. Here's a window. I bet you stay in it. Well, this is clearly showing us that the price is exceeding its expected move and is moving farther than it should. And if the S&P is doing it, you can bet that other markets are doing it too. All right. so a good rule of thumb, if we are constantly breaking out of the range here, you don't want to do iron condors anywhere else. The week isn't done, so we don't want to count the current week as uh, a breakout, right? Or as a uh, closed outside of because, well, the week isn't closed yet. Let's take a look down at the bottom. We are more than 1% above the weekly 10 period moving average, which is not a big deal at all. 1% is just uh, just getting started. So we're not overbought by any measure here. We don't need to worry about, you know, did yesterday move too far, too fast, or any kind of metrics like that. Not on the weekly, it didn't. So, you know, let's kind of say it that way. And here we have the daily, how far above or below the 10-day moving average. We're 1% above the 10-day moving average. So while yesterday felt really extreme, in the grand scheme of things, we're not overbought. We haven't moved too far, too fast. And this thing does not owe us a pullback. Linear regression, dot plot statistics, least squared method. Everything out there says this thing is fine and that it does not owe us a reciprocated pullback at this point. So that doesn't mean we can't go down, just that it doesn't owe us a move down. It doesn't owe us a pullback. We did hit the daily pivot point yesterday, and yet it held and we're above it. Today, we have another MDP, and we are quite extended beyond the weekly pivot point. So being above the weekly pivot tells us we need to look for long trades. When we get to extended beyond the 10-week, we actually start to uh, look for things to slow down. It doesn't necessarily mean it has to stop and fall down. It just very likely means that the any advance from here to the upside is going to be hard work. That's, that's it, right? It's just going to be harder. The analogy, if we continue with, say, the discussion from last week, we think about that guy running up the hill, right? And then he kind of flattens out, catches his breath, runs up the hill. 
the analogy of this move beyond the weekly pivot point at that level would be kind of like getting up to Pike's Peak, really high elevations, and then still trying to run the same distance. Lack of oxygen, less oxygen. No one's trying to trip the guy and throw him down the hill. He's just going to have a lot harder of a time continuing to advance at that level. And so he would slow down. Same thing with price. It's a funny little analogy, but it's not mine. I wish I could take credit for it, but nope. It works, though. Fits. B-I-T-O. Uh, we often refer to this as a Bitcoin ETF, but it's really not. It's a Bitcoin strategy ETF. It's a nuanced difference. I mean, there's just a, a lot of little legal things that go in, into the difference. The main thing is if they come out with that real Bitcoin ETF, you're talking trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. Right? Because it's going to be a the most accessible two-way market for Bitcoin. Period. I mean, like full stop right there. So uh, that's why it was such a big deal yesterday. And it's also very likely why the move that we're seeing in Bitcoin and in Bitcoin proxies very likely isn't done. So when it comes to those proxies, we've got Riot, Mara, Coin, Hut, Hive. There's five names right there alone. And that doesn't even scratch the surface, right? But those are usually the, the more popular, more liquid names to focus on. So the BITO is down this morning, 1.74%. Uh, the GBTC is another Bitcoin related product. Um, kind of put those two together. They're both down, which is not much of a surprise. China is down. Emerging markets are down, which makes sense because emerging markets is basically China. Bonds are down a half of a percent. And then the rest of these don't meet our criteria for how far down or how far up they are. Nat gas is up, kind of makes sense. You know, that thing's just going to continue to chop about burning up money. And energy isn't unmoved enough for our criteria either. So communications, XLF names, or excuse me, XLC names, Meta, Google, Activision, Comcast, Netflix, Disney. Some of those names are up this morning. All right, so it's not Netflix. Google had a really great textbook breakout yesterday. It's very likely a continuation on uh, on Google. It's not Google. Activision. All right, well, they might be up, but... Um, they're not up by very much. Let's try to flip this the other direction then. Yeah, no, we just got things that are down. Okay, so EVs then. EVs are down, got whacked pretty hard. Lee, Neo, Nikola, Rivian, Tesla, XPEV. That's kind of the, the basket or the collection. Notice the gap down and then the failure to close that gap. So we got the, the gap. It, it tried to correct. And the best it could do is resolve the liquidity gap, not the actual physical gap. So that's a good start. But if we can't get back above that level, then we're going to continue to aim for the downside in this. Let's see if any one of them really stand out more than the other. Here's Neo trying to recover, and it looks very similar. Uh, Lee. Lee is much weaker than the others, or at least weaker than Neo. 
XPEV has made it back up to the liquidity gap. Tesla actually closed the real gap. It got it done. Just barely, but barely counts. Uh, Rivian has so much liquidity that it didn't even generate a gap. It just traded down and now it's trading back up. Keep my eye on those today for especially something like Neo that might it might try to retest that nine and a half from yesterday. It'd be a nice follow through. So the EVs were down the most. Crypto's like right behind it. They're kind of neck and neck. Riot. Coin. Mara. Those kind of things. And then the China ADRs. So we're talking, you know, PDD, JD. JD got a gut punch yesterday. The gap is still there from this morning. It looks very similar to these uh, EV plays. Baba working on trying to get that gap closed. So far, it's not working. And they might just call that quits. That's a... Uh, Massive dark bull print. And Baidu, lack of liquidity completely. I mean, it's barely registering anything more than a tick. So crypto EV and China ADRs down the most. Then we basically get into a flat market and we have nothing that's really up on the other side. Unlike yesterday where we had this broad push in everything. We come in and look at, you know, like the NY Fang, this is your Monster 7. And you can see their strong participation. And KRE and financials, their involvement and their participation. Today, we don't have any of that. We've got this Dash for Trash junk and the China junk and some EV names. We need more than that if we're going to have a rally. Now, the thing is, we don't have to fall, but there's nothing here saying that we're going to continue this advance. On one hand, that's really good, right? Kind of follow my logic here. If you get up in the morning and you come in and you see that the S&P is up 3%, you're not really interested in trying to trade it long, right? Because it's already moved 3%. Like, whatever. I missed that run. Slept through it. But when you come in and you find that we're only just slightly down, we're not really up, we're not really down, we haven't really gone anywhere at all. Well, now you've got a reason to stick around and trade today, right? Because now we got the capacity to go somewhere. So the fact that we're not really up all that much this morning is not a bad thing to me or down, really, because, you know, there's no reason to assume that we're going to go down. We want the data to come out. We got a lot of data on the table today. We want to hold that 50% level, that line in the sand that we talked about. And other than that, we just want to let some uh, flows point us in the direction of the moves. Speaking of flows, you know, if we tried to see what things this morning are really making moves, although I know, you know, it's maybe not as, uh, as popular, would be to just find the things with the most volume, right? So something like Teo is hitting the scanners this morning. Hey, it's penny stock stuff, right? Not my cup of tea, uh, but once you know how to read price and trade price, price is price. It doesn't really matter what the price is. Teo is the one getting fired this morning. You can see the moves in here. It's just flow, right? Or VFS is starting to pick up a little bit of flows. AXLA.
TCJH, those kind of things, right? And again, not my jam, really. Just um, if we're looking at what's really moving this morning, or things with a really high short interest, GES, for an example, a high short interest name getting squeezed has been getting squeezed since that earnings. This is not done. Their cover to short is another eight days, I believe. So there's plenty of shorts in there that still need to get out. And when you're short, how do you get out? You buy to close. Adds to the buying, adds to the buying, adds to the buying. You can usually run a, a Discord bot and the command for short float or high short float or high interest short float, something like that. There's like four different commands. And you can just get a list, right? And the list doesn't change very much most of the time. So it's not usually too hard to figure out. And when you're on something like TradingView, it'll give you the short interest cover, right? there, Or, or Webull also gives you time to cover. So that kind of information is readily available on different platforms. ADTX is another one with a um, short float right list, right? So getting a little move this morning. Not my jam, for sure. All right, so Tesla is one of the better ones to look at this morning. It's already closed the gap, so it removes a little bit of the, the quote, work that needs to be done. And at this point, it's primed up really nice. All you have to do is get a breakout above yesterday's high, and you're on the run in Tesla. Similarly, all you have to do is break below our own Globex low and you've got to move to the downside in Tesla. So it's not that bad, right, for a setup. You could get, try it early. There's no reason that you have to wait necessarily one direction or another. So with that in mind, if we come into the open and we're still within this channel that we've got defined, you could look at a break above the close as a starting point and then a break above yesterday's high as your add-in point. So maybe you start with just a couple of contracts down here, keeping your risk light. And then once it fulfills or validates at a, a better breakout level, then you add you know, the rest of your contracts. If you're trading on trade of eight, or not trade of eight, um, tasty trades, it caps out at 10 contracts, right? Your commissions do. So 11 trades, 11 contracts, is no more costly than 1,100 contracts when it comes to the commission cost, right? Darn commissions. Resort fees. That's what Tasty Trades calls them, resort fees. Neo, on the other hand, is an example of something that still needs to um, get the work done, right? It hasn't come over to close the gap or anything like that. It's got a lot of work to do. And a lot of things are going to look like NEO today, which is why Tesla, since it already has that gap close, looks better for an opportunity. I mentioned Google earlier. Google had a nice setup yesterday. So we've been watching it on the daily and the weekly. Here's that weekly. And you can see that we had this big control bar back here. That's the, the one that's been in control, 133.74. Well, we got that breakout yesterday all the way up to 136. Sure, it gave back quite a bit, um, but it's still in the upper portion of that candle. And we are looking at a weekly, right? So if we take that over to the daily, let's use yesterday's level because that's what's going to be important for today. The half back level, 134.41. So we come in today, we can see that half back measure. We got below it yesterday and managed to get back above it. And we're holding it this morning. It needs to hold that, really. We can be a little lenient. And as long as it holds this high pivot of 133.77 from yesterday, as long as it stays above that level, then the move higher 
is still valid. We get below that and you really got to consider that maybe we can't get up there, right? Because that would give us a lower low. Textbook uh, reversal pattern 101, right? You set the high, you pull back, that sets, you know, usually a higher low. Next thing in concern is that we get, you know, a higher high, which we didn't get, right? We got a lower high and then we started working on getting higher highs. But this low is now of concern. Sure, we've got a higher low here. We break that, we break that, and we're headed down here. Get the scribble all over the chart. All right, everybody, I think that lines you up for the day. TIO, TSHA, those kind of things for pennies. Uh, short floats probably feel like they missed out yesterday, could see some follow through. Otherwise, for these really big moves, it's got to get out of yesterday's range. And for most names, that's not going to happen, right? At least not today. Be careful, be safe, guys. Watch the clock, and I will see you all tomorrow.